look at it. Hey, everybody, it's Bruno on NB, where it can't all be serious. I'm joined today with the nice pink sweater, because this is important. Mrs. Electric, that's why I, I, that's why I'm going to call you right now. Uh, <laughs> no voltage required. Christine Johansson from monarchsmedia.com. Hi, everyone. How are you Thanks so much for having me, Bruno. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you here because I don't know if I can live up to the contra electricity. You know, we have a positive and a neutron and all that stuff because you definitely have the the high voltage that I'm always looking for for our show. And before we kind of get carried away and blah, 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 because I'm pretty good at that. Um, hey, new set. Not too yeah. bad. OK, Great. looks good. Uh, be like before it. we get on, uh, I'm not being vain. Those are not my jerseys. Those are my kids' jerseys that gave it to me. So, new set. I thought I'd put those up. Well, somebody thought I'd put those up. So, um, our thumbnail says scaling your business. So, let's start off by solving a problem for somebody who's watching this. So, what do you mean by scaling your business? Well, there's a lot of businesses that rely on trading their time for money. So service providers, spa owners, beauty entrepreneurs, psychologists, lawyers, doctors, accountants, anyone who is really a professional service provider that gets stuck trading their time for money. And it's the truth is, is that we're limited to the number of hours that we have in the day and the number of clients that we can see every week. So the problem that that I solve is helping business owners to scale their business by stepping into a new paradigm of instead of trading their time for money, they're trading their value for money. OK, so tell me or tell our, our people what exactly you mean by trading your value, because. Um, different people view the word values. So what do you mean by value? Give us some examples. The value, the the problem that you are solving. Uh. So yeah, so that's what I mean by value is the value of the problem that you are solving. So and shifting the the like the paradigm shift is instead of valuing like whether you bill out bill yourself out at $250 an hour $500 an hour, you know, high paid lawyers, $850 an hour, you are still in that, that framework of valuing your time versus valuing the problem that you are solving. And the, the business model that I help entrepreneurs create is an online academy, is online courses where you are taking what's in your mind and putting it into creating an asset, creating your own intellectual property, your own IP, something that you can create once and sell over and over again as an online course, as a workshop, as an academy, as a masterclass, and, and adding this additional revenue stream to your existing business. Because the truth is many high paid professionals, they're, they're, mm just able to step away from their business and say, oh, I'm not able to see my clients anymore. This is about adding an additional revenue stream that can eventually potentially replace your current income. So give us an example or a couple of examples. Of, you don't have to say the clients unless you want to promote them. That's totally up to you. But what are some of the, I guess, okay, uh, other words, if I am this type of person or business, I should call you ASAP. Give me that, yeah. your ideal client, I guess. Yeah, so um, one of my, well, I, I have several examples and case studies of clients, but of my probably my favorite one was I had a, a woman business owner hire me about four years ago, and she had an in-person workshop that she was delivering. She was traveling across Canada delivering this two-day weekend workshop. And she came to me at the in 2019, at the beginning of 2019, and she said, Christine, I'm just tired of all this travel. I miss my kids. I don't want to be 
always traveling. Do you think I could put my workshop online? And I said, yes, absolutely. Like, let's do this thing. And we we simply video recorded her whole workshop, um, created a whole bunch of master classes and lessons and worksheets and really put her in-person workshop into a box. And then I built out all of the sales funnels, the marketing campaigns, the emails, all of the things so that she could then be selling this on-demand workshop that didn't rely on her being there at all. That's now, great. fast forward to the pandemic and the first three months of the pandemic, she actually made a million dollars per month. So she made $3 wow. million dollars in the first three months of the pandemic selling her workshop. Wow, that's incredible. So yeah, this is this is what is possible with online courses. And you know, it really also works well for people who are selling a tangible product. So for example, in the beauty industry, there are like, and I'm not a beauty expert by any means, but there are like women love to buy beauty products to enhance their beauty. It's one thing to buy the product. It's another thing to actually know how to use the product. Mm, got it. What I've done, I've actually worked with several beauty entrepreneurs that we've looked at their business and we've said, okay, how can we take this product that you're selling and create a course around it to really empower your customers to know how to use it and really get addicted to it so that they keep coming back for more and more and more. And sometimes we just give that course away for free. It's like free education. It's like really this is about every business needs education. Every business could benefit from teaching their customers, their clients about their product or service and how to integrate it into their lives. Because even if we look at a company like Xerox, the photocopying machine, you know, they were, their first business was like, or first business model was selling these expensive photocopier machines. But there was only a small percentage of other businesses who could afford this expensive machine. And they shifted, and I'm, I'm kind of getting on a tangent here, but like they shifted their business model to, well, instead of selling the big machine, and I think at the time they were selling it for like $30,000 or something, they said, well, how do we make this a low entry point and then sell based on per paper, per photocopy, per ink? And then they they shifted the business model to that retainer, that retainer, that monthly, um, you know what I'm saying, that yeah. the, the customer that keeps coming back again and again and again. And we can do that in the online education space too, because we are creating essentially the Netflix. We're creating the Netflix for your business is the 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 customers who like gym, like fitness, fitness facilities, for example, that's another great example I have, is um, one of my clients owns a, a very long standing fitness studio in Calgary. And she's had clients come to her for 25 years. And when the pandemic hit and she was completely shut down, she came to me and she said, Christine, what do I do? And I said, well, we're gonna create you a whole new brand and we're going to adjust the the fitness the exercises that you teach to be online and she launched her membership and now she has like hundreds of of clients on her $50 a month membership that they started 3 years ago in the pandemic and they've never quit even though she's opened back up again and they're coming back to see her in the studio there is something to be said to having having your person in the palm of your hand so they have her in their in, on an app on their phone that they can do their their fitness routine anytime anywhere that's great um so that's that's kind of your your ideal client is somebody that wants to scale their business that way 
and and have it um i'm you know uh i guess repeatable and not redoable every time right is that is that kind of what you're doing right yeah exactly so that's awesome so um i'm going to tell you something can i take some of the smoke out of the fire on this one because i want to give you the mouse yep. and control this conversation uh and tell everybody how you started in this business because th this is, was not what you were doing and of course i'm i'm leading the witness a little bit because that's the story you told on how we met when we met sorry okay that the mouse story <laughs> yeah i love that i i i'm using it ever since uh, so that yeah no that's great bruno i'll i'm happy to to share that story um well, I, I mean, I've been in digital marketing for 15 years. I actually used to be a petroleum engineer, downtown oil and gas, and actually hated every minute of it because I, I knew I needed to be in a world where I was helping people and helping create transformation on the planet. And I was really drawn to digital marketing because I, I was buying people's courses to help my own my own journey of of healing really my own inner journey of of healing healing past traumas healing unhealthy habits and and I was buying other people's courses and stepping into online forums and really saw the transformation in my own life that happened through through the online world and um and I started in my early days, basically a lot of what I was doing was just the copywriting. Like I'm, I'm a writer, like I've always been a writer since I was a child. And it just came so naturally for me is the writing for, you know, email campaigns and websites. And I was often hired as a subcontractor into other people's marketing agencies just to do the writing piece. And I, one day I found myself in a boardroom, hired as the subcontractor, like copywriter. And I, I sat there, it was a room full of men and we had this female client sitting there. And this, I was hired to help prepare the, the whole like marketing strategy for this client. But the owner of the agency was the one presenting it. He was the one presenting my strat like I basically made the slides for him and he was butchering every single slide like he didn't know what he was talking about he didn't totally understand the client and where she was coming from and what her big goals were and as we were sitting there in this boardroom a voice spoke into me and said Christine take the mouse and I was like what take the mouse like no you're just like the one woman in the room besides the client said again, Christine, take the mouse. So I took a deep breath because I'm a believer that we need to listen to our intuition and listen to that inner voice. Hmm. I took a deep breath and I said, excuse me, I have some things I, I want to share and say. And I took my hand and I, I happened to be sitting right beside the the main agency owner who was leading the presentation, I took my hand and I nudged his hand off the mouse. He had his hand on the mouse. I nudged his hand off the mouse and it was still a bit warm and sweaty from his hand because he was so nervous. And I said, we need to back up a few slides. And I literally went back to the very beginning of the presentation. <laughs> and started all over again and presented the strategy the way that I had imagined it. And, and it was that conversation that like shifted so many things in my world because after that meeting, the client, well, after, after that presentation, the client was almost in tears. And then her and I, that was our very first time meeting. And and we met for coffee the next day and she said to me, Christine, I'm firing that marketing agency and I'm hiring you as my chief marketing officer to oversee everything. She said, I loved when you put your hand on the mouse. I loved when you took it back from that other man who didn't know what he was talking about. 
And it was just like, it was a, that moment was a game changer in my own career, but it's also like, I love the story because I think for so many of us, there's the question is where in your life and business do you need to put your hand on the mouse? Where in your life and business do you need to take your power back that maybe you've you've delegated power to someone who isn't meeting meeting you where you're at, who isn't getting you the results that you want, and who you like Frank, like, yeah, that's just the question. Like, where in your life and business do you need to take your power back and put your hand on the mouse? Even though it might feel awkward, even though it might feel like a step out of line. Because I think for all of us, no matter what stage we're at, there is there there's always an opportunity for us to take our power back. So Christine, this is the pressing question I had for you. Just a second. So at some point, did you wipe your hand from the sweat? <laughs> because I was a little worried about that, that that story. I'm like, everybody's hugging and kissing, but you you touched a sweaty mouse. So. I did. Yes, I did. In that moment, well, this was pre-COVID days, so we weren't as obsessed with like hygiene as we were. But oh, let's there you go. Say, in that moment, I was like, I was like, okay, Christine, just you know. I can handle it. I can handle the grossness now. And then, but yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm certainly just joking about that, but that was the part that uh, a lot of people kind of went. Yeah. You know, when you were telling the story and, yeah. and taking the mystery away, this is where I met you, right? Where is it? Yeah, oh, woman. Can you see it. that? Our good friend, Heather Andrews, who was on this show, by the way. And you go to page 28. Boom. There you go. There we go. There I am. You're sitting right? on the gold mine. Yeah. There we go. And money. I must say, it was it was an absolute great presentation to the point where I grabbed the mouse. And I did, like, there were a lot of people there. And that's a little bit, you know, there's two people that actually have been on the show. They're going to be uh, produced, I don't know, before or after. And um, I had both of you um, on the show because... I just went over and I said, whoa, those were, I like that, right? And you got in trouble, I think, at the end. I think you did. So, and I said, that's the type of person I need to talk to right there. I, I'm so, a bit of a rule breaker, Bruno. I'm not going to lie. I, yeah. I, I'm i in the business of change and creating positive change on the planet. And I don't think that we create change by being rule followers. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you something. I am not a queen, but I am calling my power back to me. I am a source of uh, wealth and my divine power is in my hands. Is that, did I get that right? You got it. Good yeah. job. But I'm not a queen, but I, I, because I, 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 I can't be the queen. So why don't you, why don't you tell the story about this? I kept it. Of course I kept it. Oh, well. What, do you think I just made that up? <laughs> this is yours. This is yours. Oh, I love so tell it. the story. You gave everybody one of these things. And why don't you I elaborate on, I'm joking about I'm the queen because it was a women's event. I get it. There was like guys there. But so walk us through the four, well, the four steps to getting back your power. You didn't think well, I was listening, did you? No. Well, you were obviously paying attention. But I want to say, you know, I work with a lot of women, but I work with, I work with <clears> kings <throat> as well. I yeah, work no, I, I I get it, but the reason the reason yeah. why you said I am queen, it was a women's event. So walk, I like those four steps. It's pretty simple to say, tougher yeah. to do. Walk us through that because I think that's your cornerstone. You were saying that's my cornerstone, or those are the cornerstones, or whatever your pillars or whatever. Well, I think yeah, the first step is like like I said, calling your power back to you. I call my power back to me because. We've given our power away to other experts, other, especially women. We give it away to men, especially financially. We believe that men know how to make money better than we do, manage money better than we do. Like there still is in my world, because I coach a lot of women, there is there still is a lot of stuff around women really believing that they have what it takes to earn amazing, amazing money and circulate that money so it does good. 
so that it does good in the world, it does good in their homes, and that it it magnifies, that your money magnifies. So, and then what was, okay, I call my power back to me. I'm trying to remember the order of the-, the I'm call. a source of wealth. And now, now to be very transparent, it's not that this wasn't clear. It's I can't read my handwriting because yes. my pen stopped working. So, and it's, yeah. and it's, I'm a source of wealth. I am a source of wealth, which is about that you are the source of wealth, that you don't need to rely on another person to be your source of wealth, whether that's an inheritance, a spouse, a like a, a primary client. You know, if you are in business and you have one client who's really paying most of your bills, you, like just to shift that power dynamic that, you know what? you will be just fine if anything were to happen with that relationship. And I guess I know that firsthand because that has also happened to me in my business where a lot of my business was dependent on one specific client. And when that relationship came to an end, unfortunately, uh, like I had to reinvent myself. And as entrepreneurs, I think, we're, we are constantly in the business of reinventing ourselves, of pivoting, of finding the next problem to solve. Like we are all in the business of solving problems. And there's, you know, we can look out at the world and say there's a lot of problems out there. Oh, no, that's bad for me. Well, no, actually, let's flip the switch because those problems are all opportunities for you to go after. And then the fourth step was my gold mine is in my hands because mm -hmm. I believe that every entrepreneur and whether you're in a business that you're a solopreneur, that it's just you or whether you have five employees or 50 employees, there is a gold mine there to be had. And a lot of tapping into that gold mine is shifting the business model from being like back again based on trading time for money to trading value for money you know and and interestingly enough we were talking about uh like having a leader mindset and that it starts with all this right i mean this is basically the answer to that question right well leadership to me is not about barking orders it's not about being the person at the top telling everybody what to do the a, a true leader raises other leaders mm -hmm. and whether you have like employees that you are leading it's how do you empower them to be what I would call intrapreneurs that they are being entrepreneurial within your organization that they are thinking as a leader not as a you know a peon just doing grunt work clocking in and clocking out every day so like as leaders, I think we're all in the business of raising other leaders. We want our clients to be leaders. We want them to win. We mm -hmm. want the team to be leaders. We want our audience to be leaders. And, and everyone wins. Like, everyone wins that way when they step into that next best version of themselves. That's awesome. Like, And I, and I really mean it. It was very inspiring. To be quite honest with you, 150% honest, um, I got the impression that you were... Uh, in this, you know, in the marketing business, which you are, right? Monarchs is is in the marketing business. Okay. I didn't realize how much work you did in the course business, like the, uh, you know, the online training. So that's something that, see, if you don't tell anybody, I don't know, I can't introduce you to 300,000 people. So, uh, you know, that's, you did a great job telling us that. And, but now comes the time, are you ready? Take a deep breath, right? We're going to get into what we call rapid fire. So I always believe that, People do business with you, not only because of who you know, what you know, but how you know them. And they're more inclined to trust you if they feel like they know you a little bit. So uh, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's okay. do it. Yeah. So you better get the right answer. No, I'm just joking. There's no right answer. Favorite food. First thing comes to mind. Favorite food, steak. Steak. Okay. Favorite restaurant. Doesn't have to be in the city. Oh, my gosh. You're really putting. Okay. Um. It's one of those fish restaurants in Vancouver. And I, I can't think of the name, but I was just thinking, I was there a year ago and I'm like, oh, you know, call, Vancouver, just, right on the water. 
Oh, can we just call it the fishy place? The fishy so, place in Vancouver. In, there we in go. In Vancouver. Is that, is that right near in Stanley Park? Mm, no, they're probably same owner. There's one right in the bay and one on Granville Island as well. But, ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, favorite movie? The Holiday. Okay, that's good. That's a Christmas movie with Jude Law. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely my favorite movie. Coming up. Well, this will probably air. I don't know when this is going to air, but uh, favorite actor, actress. I call them actors now. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I'm not big into celebrities. So uh, can I can I take a pass on this? Like, we'll come back. Can it be an artist? Like, like I would say Madonna. Madonna. Okay. Can, we, can we shift it to music? I'm more of a music well, person. Than hold a on. Madonna was actually in one of my favorite movies of all time. Which she one was like in, in A League of Their Own, the baseball yeah. movie. The great she was, movie. She was really good. That was a fantastic movie. That's a true story, by the way. Yeah. So uh, it was made up. I'm a that huge was... Madonna fan. I've seen her three times live in concert. That's awesome. Okay, well, that's your favorite music artist. I was going to ask that. Favorite band. Great. Favorite band. Um. Oh, my gosh. I'm a huge classic vinyl collector. <laughs> so I listen. <laughs> I do. I have I have a collection of records from the 60s and 70s. Um, oh my gosh. Band would be Queen for sure. Okay. Artist of the time would be Elton John. Okay, still around. So yeah. <clears throat> favorite city that you've traveled to? Stockholm. Okay. Fav uh, not favorite, but city that you would like to travel to one day. What about travel back to? Can I say travel back to or travel to? Well, I really, I really want to visit. Uh, how do you pronounce it? Positano in Italy. That is my. That's my next dream. Is along the Italian coast. Well, why don't we just sell a few online courses and you make that happen? Because you are the queen, and you got to call that power back to you. See, I'm calling you back, right? Thank so, you. Exactly. There you go. That is the next one I want to see on your itinerary. So um mind you i've never been there so i gotta bring that power back to me so. well yeah you're italian right <laughs> yeah just don't tell anybody uh they'll never figure it out so <laughs> somebody that you would like to meet that's alive right now and what would you ask them oh my goodness who would i like to meet who would i like to meet i would like to meet Wow. Okay. I'm not prepared for this. This is like ready, fire, aim. <laughs> this is, do you know, okay, I'll, this is a crazy, the first name, the first person that comes to me would be, is Megan Markle. I don't know why she just came to me, but like, okay. yeah. What Megan, would you like to ask her? All the, all the dir dirty secrets. <laughs> What really goes on in the royal family? Yeah, well, I think she, I, I think she'll beat you to it. I think she's just gonna put it on tape one day. So, yeah. um, how about somebody that's how about somebody that has passed away? Anybody, world oh. history? Oh, that Marilyn, you would like to meet? Marilyn Monroe for sure. What, what would you ask her? I I love Marilyn. Well, she had she created like meaningful connections with some powerful men whether that was strategic or just by her celebrity factor so i mean i would i would ask her again the same question i would ask megan markle is like tell me all the dirty secrets tell me all the secrets of the time so you, you know what's really funny is that uh, most of my viewers know that i'm a big you know yankees fan right hmm. huge yankees fan humongous and uh i like the blue jays everybody gets mad at me i like the blue jays but I, i'm not a blue jays hater but um all i do is listen to these books and i got my my kids into it funny story not funny story interesting story about marilyn monroe if you believe which folklore is that just before she died they were thinking of getting back together with joe dimaggio and joe dimaggio after she died i don't think 
yeah, you guys would have to read the book to or books. And um, I listen to more books than I read. But interesting story. If you want to look this up, if you like Marilyn Monroe, uh, Joe DiMaggio brought uh, flowers to her grave. I think it was roses for I don't know how long every week after she died. So needless to say, he was never a big fan of the Kennedys. So it was such an interesting couple of books I read about Joe DiMaggio. So it's interesting. A lot more complicated human being than a lot of people really gave her credit for. Oh, so, 100%. Yeah. Okay, so that's Marilyn Monroe. Um, <clears throat> favorite sport? I think I'm going to guess what this one is. Tell me if I get it right. Favorite? Okay, take a guess. Skiing. Well, that would be a second. The first The oh. first sport is, is water skiing. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. Do you have a favorite athlete? Um, like David Beckham. <laughs> Various reasons. <laughs> okay, because he, he's a hottie patati. He sure is. There yes. you go. I didn't meet. You know what? Um, I think I told this story. I was in Palm Springs last year, California, and they had um, the soccer tournament. You can look it up. Coachella. If you want to have a chance meeting with David Beckham, he might be there next year in February, because they have an invitational soccer tournament for the MLS. And what team does he own? I can't remember. The LA Galaxy, I think. Right. No, Florida, Miami, it, Miami. Oh, he owns Messi's team now, right? Yeah. So they go there and all the teams play in a tournament and it's such an intimate, and we ended up staying at a hotel that housed the DC United team and um, NYCFC. So I'm not, I'm a big, I'm a soccer fan, but not MLS. So I got to meet Wayne Rooney, which was his uh, teammate for years and years and years. And what a nice, he was a really, really nice guy. Not what I expected whatsoever. Doesn't look like him, like he got a little bit bigger, but super, super nice. And the NYCFC were, it was a chance meeting and they were in our small hotel and they hung out with everybody for like a week. It was really great. So, so David Beckham might be there. <clears throat> you never know. Okay. Are you ready? You get to ask me one question. Anything you want. Okay. Bruno, anything, anything I want? Yeah, I mean, we have the power to edit, so go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I have a questions. Okay, I'm going to ask a, a couple. Yeah, I I'm going to ask on. a personal question since we talked a little bit about Italy. I don't, I don't talk too much personal because it's not that interesting, but go ahead. What is your favorite Italian dish? Oh, that's simple. Pizza. pizza. It has to be pizza. Yeah. You know what's funny? I had a string of interview people, uh, like uh, guests on this show, and I go, favorite food? Sushi, sushi, sushi. And then I had three kind of Italian people, like my friend Bruna Pocconi, and I had Susie DeGiusti. She was uh, at your show, right? She mm -hmm. did a speech. And I'm asking, I go, favorite food? And I go, if you say sushi, you're going to get like a backhand from your grandmother i know that right so i had a whole bunch of sushis and a whole bunch of pizzas but i guess my favorite food is pizza not that i go crazy having it because you know but that's that's my favorite real food italian food actually that's no no my mom's uh um stuffed eggplant nobody uh -huh. makes it like my mom yeah there we go that's what i wanted to hear so yeah. stuffed eggplant stuffed with what oh uh, ground beef, cheese, they're just, yeah, they're to die for. My friends would, they still go to my parents' place in Ottawa. So, so what was your other question? I'm getting nervous about the second one. Well, my other question would be, what is your, what is your big vision for business owners across Canada? Well, we started this channel, uh, Megapix, uh, and we're going across Canada, part of the US. We're pretty excited about that. And our, I shared our story, one day we'll share it with the world. We're kind of under the radar a little bit as business owners, like our company owners. Mm -hmm. Really is to have businesses be get noticed. Um, if I have to be really honest, and maybe this will take a couple minutes if you're okay with it. But as a kid, I really, I grew up seeing the big box stores destroy the small businesses. 
And guess what happened? Um, the big box stores are not reasonably priced anymore. They're just kicking the shit out of us. Not small business. I'm talking about consumers. So, and I don't care about picking on whoever if they're going to sue me. But example, you can't, if you want to buy a two by four, you used to go to 50 lumber stores, right? Mm -hmm. um, now you can go to mostly Home Depot or Lowe's, same yeah. price, right? So I kind of have a bit of a chip on my shoulder, nothing against Home Depot or Lowe's. I'm just using that as an example, right? Yeah. And fast food is not cheap anymore. This is not cheap. And they we've we've allowed the destruction of small business fabric. And that kind of pissed me off. And it kind of pissed off my my uh, my partners because we're all small business owners. And uh, you talk about pandemic. That's kind of what our goal is. We just wanted to promote our businesses. And then we stumbled across this platform that my partners and I built. And the vision is uh, take no prisoners, bullshit to everybody and compete, compete, compete. And that's why I really love what your industry is doing. It's leveling the playing field. Like no longer do you have to like to get a Super Bowl. I'll give you an example. Super Bowl ads, you pay millions of dollars for a 30 second ad and they get, I don't know how many views, but 30 million views, whatever. I don't even know. I, don't, I think that's high, right? But with a platform like ours, I'm not shamelessly promoting my, but my platform. I'm just saying, if you know what you're doing in social media, digital media, to get a million views, I'm talking about impressions or reposts or something like that, it's not going to cost you that kind of money. So now you're a smaller company. Um, you can play. And I had this saying for a long time when I used to coach sports at you know different levels is that you know, you play your the same players over and over and you shorten the bench with kids and stuff like that. Yeah, you might win a game, you might win the championship, but you will never conquer, right? And I don't mean that from a negative point of view. It's like, if you let them play, they'll compete. If they compete, they might win. If they might win, they might conquer. And I just feel that small businesses might get bought out by big businesses. Good, let them go out and do it. So I think that's my my vision and my hope. More More, more of a hope than a vision it's to say, never surrender. Um, if you love what you do and you solve a problem, like you're saying, charge yeah. the money. People have no problems paying the money these days. It's not like back in the day, you know? And so I think that's the vision is go out there and kick some ass. And I think I would probably, I, I would probably challenge you on a stage. I'm not a keynote speaker, but I would challenge you on the words you use. And I would say 10 times worse to encourage people. <laughs> It's like, get off your, you know, whatever, because you're very colorful and I appreciate that. You know what I'm talking about, right? And you just did everything you could to encourage small businesses to get online courses, get marketing, see differently, right? And so that's kind of my vision is like, you know, be warrior type, save the world, and don't be afraid to be a small business. I guess that's what it is. No, I love it. I love it. That was I mean, a tough question because people no. normally ask me easier questions, but so this was okay. You're happy to be on here. This was lots of fun, Bruno. <laughs> lots of fun. Thank you. All right. You. I just giggle because I, I never tell people what happens on the second side, but they watch the show and they're kind of prepared, but I change the, the questions as we go. But so uh, last but not least, how do they get in touch with you? You can visit monarchsmedia.com. That's O- M-O-N-A-R-X media.com. And we're going to put it underneath here anyways. Or see, this is the magic of small business. Or if you want to get in touch with Christine and you know me, just call me. I'll give you her information. And so, but Christine, any last words? Well, I just want to encourage everyone to, like what Bruno said, take no prisoners, don't give up, take your power back, keep going. Like, I believe that you were given this vision, whatever your vision is, for a reason. And you just need to keep taking the next step and next step. So I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe put some steps in that process, what you're saying. Small business, take no prisoners, grab the mouse, then use the wipes. And, and don't forget the wipes. Okay, don't there you go. All right. Your hands along the way. <laughs> and and always wear your Yankees toque, okay? Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, 
<laughs> All right, Christine, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure and uh, we'll see everybody next time. Thanks, Bruno.